Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. Hello and welcome to Invest Africa. I'm Nozi Pombanjwa. Now, with the 2016 budget speech fresh in the minds of South Africans, Invest Africa turns its focus today to the efficiency of Africa's tax systems and whether they are coping with the rising pressures that they are expected to respond to. To help us understand the progress that tax administrators are having on the continent, today I'm joined by Dermot Gaffney. He is Associate Director for Tax at KPMG, as well as Advocate Lucia Shongwane. She is the Africa Tax Leader at EY Advisory. Thank you uh, for making the time to join us. Lucia, let me start off with you, and, and maybe also Dermot, you can come in on this question. Let's paint the picture. How would you describe the state of tax systems in Africa? Thank you, Nasipo, and good afternoon to your uh, listeners at home. Uh, I think before we can actually talk about the state of the tax system, we need to understand what is your good tax system. Mm, mm. Why will we say it is good? Why will we say it is not working out? The main purpose why you have a tax system is that you can collect sufficient revenue, isn't it? Right. So that you can invest in the programs that you need to invest in for the government you need to also make sure that the government can provide the social services that it needs to provide for its, its citizens with that you need to say are we collecting enough it doesn't matter what else we do if we're not collecting the correct mm. amounts that we need to collect we do not have a good tax system so if that is our, our layman's understanding I think it's a fantastic uh, explanation that you've given us would you say that overall on the African continent, uh, tax systems are working, they are collecting enough to address uh, the social services that governments have to, uh, have to give to the populace? You need to go further and say, are our laws transparent? Are they efficient in the sense of, are we able to actually implement them to make sure that we can collect enough? And from where I'm sitting, we are not there yet. Yeah. But then you can say that, Given everything that is happening, we are evolving. And not only in South Africa or in Africa, mm. the world over, if you think about it, the tax system is constantly evolving because there are new challenges. You have the digital economy, things are moving, but I think the tax system is also moving in the right direction. Mm. So it, we is, are getting somewhere. Is it moving fast enough though, Dermot? Because I'm, I'm getting the sense that if we are evolving, it's almost a moving target. Where is Africa compared to the rest of the world? Sure, it is a moving target. And one of the biggest challenges facing Africa, of course, is that the population is estimated to double by 2050. So really you have to look at taxes per capita, mm. uh, tax per head of population. And some African countries, the amount of tax collected is very low. If you look at somewhere like Ethiopia or the DRC, it can be a low, as low as $11 per citizen. Now you can't really provide much social services or deal with the uh, infrastructure investment required to grow the economy in those mm. countries if you're not collecting the tax. Of course, many of them are heavily dependent on overseas development aid right. uh, or, or attract foreign direct investment, but it's very hard. So Africa tax systems have been, of course, hugely dependent on mm. resource-based industries and extractive industries. And that, of course, means they're subject to volatility of price. Mm. So yes, they're there. Um, you need to look at the absolute amount of tax collected by the system, but you also need to look at the balance of the tax right. and how is it spread. And is there over-dependence on one single industry or one single type of tax? And you're saying that history has shown that we've had a, a, a heavier reliance on the extractive industries, yes. but we always are talking about the diversification of economies in Africa. Yes. If you look at the tax systems then, would you say that the tax systems show that we haven't diversified at a sufficient enough pace because with commodities being under pressure, does this mean tax systems are under pressure? It, it does, and you look at a number of countries in Africa who are dependent largely on a single form of tax, like um, Angola or Algeria are heavily dependent, Nigeria, dependent heavily on a single form of tax. Mm. Whereas you look at somewhere like Kenya, you see a better balance. So there is 
a very diverse picture. It's a very diverse continent mm. and there's a very diverse picture emerging. I like the point about diversity because I think it's going to allow us to, uh, to peel out some of the best practices. But Lucia, before we get there, I want to go back to your nuts and bolts uh, approach to understanding uh, tax uh, as you laid it out at the beginning. Just give us the sense, in addition to transparent laws, what else needs to be in the basket for that tax system to work and for the public to buy into paying tax? Um, certainty for me is very critical mm -hmm. and not only for the public, for your direct investments as well. If the laws are not certain, we don't know what we need to be collecting. People look at the laws, they want to structure their transactions according to what we have and the laws are not clear you change them as you go on, or you're giving the tax authorities the power to just change the laws as they go on. That creates a volatile situation. Mm. So you want certainty in the laws as well. What has been the experience of change in administration with changes in tax laws? Is that something that where we can say there's a trend here in Africa uh, that we could look at, or has there been relative certainty irrespective of whether there's been change in government? I've actually felt that our laws are based on ambiguity. Uh. It looks like we have to be on two different sides. Remember that as a taxpayer, it's not I do not want to pay taxes, but I want to make sure that I pay the right amounts. Yes. So the right amounts or what is fair or equitable in the circumstances depends on what the laws say. The tax authorities sitting on the other side are also saying it is fair that you pay this amount. Yes. Then you get to a point where you have ambiguity. Mm. So that's why you end up in the courts. What about the systems and the infrastructure then, Dermot? Because if there is a law that specifies right amounts, is there a system then that, that is then aligned to make sure that we are paying according to that law? Sure, and, and a lot of it depends on the quality of the resources available to the tax administration in that, in yeah. that particular country. And we see a huge variation in that across the continent as well. Um, but just to add uh, to what Lucia said, you say that there's also a requirement for certainty is definitely there. Everybody wants to know what is the amount of tax. But also you need to see a sense of balance. Citizens will pay their taxes if they feel they're fair and they are being spent on the appropriate mm. programs. Mm. They're going to meet the needs of the citizens and not the needs of a small few individuals. So those are factors that also have an impact in Africa that mm. you have to take into account. And of course, the higher the tax rates go, the greater the incentive for tax evasion exists, right. and the harder it is because the public don't perceive it to be fair. And of course, you've raised an important issue, which is the expenditure side of the conversation, and, and we'll get to that. But perhaps a, another point that you raised that I want to throw to you, Lucia, is the balance between the public paying tax and corporate tax, and if there are other forms of tax that we should know about, and what is the balance when it comes to Africa? Uh, corporate tax in particular, how do we fare with the rest of the world? Um, what you look at first is what are your three main taxes that we collect? Mm. You look at corporate taxes, mm -hmm. but that is your second because you have personal income taxes first. first. That is the highest, that's where we collect more in terms of when you look at the percentage. People would want to pay, like he said, when you know what we are using that for. So you get to the marginal taxes, the tax rate. If you're earning more, we are asking you to pay more because you're earning more. It's, for me, equitable. You're not saying, I don't want to broaden the tax base, but right. you are saying people who are actually earning more should be able to give more to the fund. Mm. It brings us, of course, to high net worth individuals. Uh, again, are there, are there trends that we can say, this is what happens in Africa when it comes to high net worth individuals? Because oftentimes when it comes to tax evasion and avoidance, it's usually that particular category that people will point to and say, but these guys have bank accounts uh, in the Cayman Islands or in, in, in Switzerland, or wherever the, the case may be. Or are we being sensationalist when we say that? It actually goes back to your laws. What does the law allow them to do? Mm. If you are not allowed to send money outside the country without following a certain process, and you actually do, you're acting illegally. So that we need to claim, and it has got nothing to do with uh, tax, tax avoidance. Mm. It is tax evasion. Clearly. Is this is this a problem in Africa though? Can we say that we have this problem or if we compare it to the rest of the world, it's more or less the same or do we have an issue here? If we didn't have, the Minister of Finance would not have called for the am amnesty that he has talked mm. about mm. saying, bring your illicit funds back to the country 
or comply with the laws to make sure that they are outside the country legally. Dermot, so there is a problem. You're nodding. Well, I am, but I think there is a certain amount of sensationalism about high net worth individuals. Okay. If you look at statistics the OECD and the African Union have produced, they show that most of the illicit outflows are from large corporate entities. 65% is in that sphere. 30% comes from organized crime. So there, there, there is a lot of jealousy pointed at high net worth individuals because they've done well as individuals and they've seen a perception that they're easy to find. So you're saying we don't necessarily have a, a crisis when it comes to high net worth individuals avoiding tax on the African continent? I don't think it's any worse than anywhere else, uh, any other jurisdiction. I don't think Africa is particularly worse than most of the developed world. You should so you agree with, with that point of view? Does it sit well <laughs> with you? If you consider cases like uh, the King case that SARS settled, like yes. I think last year or year before last, it creates like a bit of a challenge because there are people who actually have the money who have a certain attitude of I am not going to give the government their fair share. So to a large extent, you can say there are certain individuals who are going to exploit the system. Mm. Why? Because they have the funds to do that. Mm. They have the funds to employ your tax um, advisors. They have the funds to employ your tax lawyers who can drag this case for the next 10 years. I mean, King's case is your perfect Absolutely. example. And if King didn't think, and this is not Lucia pointing out to King in particular, I'm just giving you an example. If King didn't think he, like if he thought he did all the right things, he would not have gone to SARS to settle. Amnesty? So he knows that he did things not according to the book throughout. And you raised the point earlier around of the, the Minister of Finance uh, uh, introducing the idea of amnesty for these high net worth individuals. What do you think Dermot is going to be the response to this? Is it strong enough for somebody who's sitting on a, a couple of million of US dollars and hasn't paid their tax to say, okay, maybe I'm going to do it now? So now I think it's a great opportunity for people to regularize their affairs. The special voluntary disclosure program, uh, as SARS call it, they the pains to point it out that it's not an amnesty, mm -hmm. but uh, it is a chance to regularize your affairs. Why is it relevant now? The automatic exchange of information between the countries comes into force in 2017. Mm -hmm. So the information is going to be made available to SARS going forward. So those people who have illicit funds offshore have a great opportunity mm. to bring them back. And of course, the country, the economy here needs the money very badly. So mm. it's, it's a double incentive to bring it back on shore as well. Well, on that point of automatic exchange of information, let's take a short break. We're going to pick up on this point when we come back from the break. And we're also going to look at the expenditure side of tax on the African continent. I'll see you in two minutes. Welcome back to Invest Africa. Still with me, my guests in Johannesburg, Domad Gaffney's Associate Director for Tax at KPMG and Advocate Lucia Shongwane, Africa Tax Leader at EY Advisory. Now, before we went to break, we started talking about collaboration on the continent and also on the global playing field that could really bring more efficiency and transparency to tax systems in Africa and the world over. So I'm going to pick up on that point. And let me come to you, Dermot, on that point. You raised it around, you know, uh, this is going to be a new reality very, very soon. What does that collaboration look like? So for the first time, different sovereign countries are going to automatically exchange information about business activities and funds held in bank accounts in their jurisdiction that belong to citizens of another jurisdiction or, or companies in another jurisdiction. So that's up to now that information exchange has been generally on request and not everybody played the game. One of the main outputs from the OECD base erosion and profit shifting, the mm. BEPS debate, has mm. been an automatic exchange of information and accompanied by something called country by country reporting. So this comes into play, Lucia, country by country reporting, there's an automatic exchange of information. What does this mean for Africa and corporate tax evasion and avoidance in Africa? For me, the first thing is that sentiment of taxpayers do not want to pay enough taxes. It is an opportunity for taxpayers to actually say, here I am, I'm transparent, I can show you where I'm spending in terms of my taxes. 
because the, the whole attitude is they are not paying enough or they're shifting. If there are those who are shifting, obviously it will be very clear. But yeah. then the transparency means that I am able to say, yes, my margin is following my balance sheet right. in Mauritius, for instance. Or I did not choose Mauritius just because it is a low tax jurisdiction. I have reasons why I am operating mm. in Mauritius. Mm. So that will help taxpayers. And that is how I think taxpayers should be looking at this. But from the tax authorities as well, when we talked about base erosion, the first thing was, oh my word, that means that there is so much that I should be getting in my country and right. I'm not getting. It might not necessarily be correct. Mm. We just need to make sure that the facts are out there for everyone to and see. And so with more transparency, you can get a better picture of what is due uh, yes. to that particular market. Is this a, a development that you also think is going to be good for investment? Because investment sentiment also will, will take tax as a risk that they take into consideration before they plow dollars in that particular market. Oh, exactly. I mean, uh, you know, most investors want to have certainty. They want to have transparency and understanding of the rules mm. of the jurisdiction that they're sending their money to. So that's very critical uh, in for successfully attracting foreign direct investment mm. and getting that balance. But equally, more and more economies on the continent of Africa are having to rely on their own resources mm. and they need transparency to be able to understand how do we get a balance in our tax system, how do we get the amo right amount of tax mm. and then of course how do we spend it. Mm. Uh, Lucia, yes, uh, you've got a point there. Yeah. I think your other biggest challenge is to make sure that we get the right resources in the tax authorities. Right. Africa is lacking in terms of tax skills we are not beefed up properly. So that is very, very important. And this now flows from the educational system uh, to, to get those skills built, or how do we get it right? It, actually, even from the educational system, because if you think about it, not so many people thought that tax can be a career, if you think about it. Mm. So we need to make sure that we attract more resources or more skills. We train more people to get into the tax authorities. But with that, the most important part becomes what SARS did, because SARS was computing, competing excuse me, for resources at some stage with the big force. Mm. And what did they do? They decided we need autonomy. We need to operate outside the government have our own salary bands, have our own you know, incentives, uh, employee value proposition to make sure that we can attract the right skills. Mm. So that is something that I would advise the tax authorities in Africa to think about. Mm. Can I add to that? There are other agencies such as the IMF who help fund tax authorities in a number of African jurisdictions and help them to understand what is best practice in the world of tax. Mm. How do they compare with other economies that, who are at a similar stage of development on other continents and how do they then bring in the right laws that help them administer the tax Mm. property in their jurisdiction. There are, there are a couple of hot potatoes that I want to put down. Let's start off with our own uh, SARS. Uh, in particular, uh, a lot of the, the negativity coming out of SARS, the SARS wars as they've been called. Is this denting brand South Africa from an investment point of view? Is it making investors nervous that we seem to have a bit of political infighting happening there? If we don't get it right, and for me, it's like the sooner we resolve what is happening between the SARS commissioner and the Minister of Finance, the better for the interest of the country mm. as a whole and for Africa, actually, not only South Africa. It is very important because people looking from outside are thinking because of this not agreeing on certain things between the minister and the commissioner, SARS is not operating. But I think the reality is that SARS is actually continuing to operate. The mm. wheel is still moving, but we need to close this ASAP it's the because perception. it is denting us. It is denting us, and that is the view from Lucia. Do you agree, Dema? Do you get a sense that we're, we're taking a bit of a knock because of this not being concluded? I think, you know, when you look at how do governments raise their money, effectively they can borrow money or they can raise taxes. And if they're borrowing money in the international markets, then those markets rate their credit ratings. And we've had a huge debate here about the status of South African debt, sovereign debt. Mm. And if it falls to a junk rating, then the premium that you have to pay rises so massively higher. and of course the cost then of funding it starts to absorb your tax revenue just paying the interest on the money you've borrowed so the rating agencies play an important part and international confidence mm. in the system plays a an important part and obviously any dispute between 
the, the, the Treasury and the Minister of Finance and the tax authority itself in any jurisdiction is a cause of concern mm. and it needs to be resolved. Um, SARS is a world recognised as a world class tax administration okay. um, and it's doing and continues to do a good job. So people shouldn't overly panic on this, but this does need to be resolved. These need to be resolved. I think we both, ag we all agree uh, at, at the table that this needs to be a priority. What about the expenditure side, Lucia? We've just a couple of weeks ago had the 2016 budget. And again, putting South Africa in context of the broader continent, are there trends that we can say, th these are the big ticket items that African governments seem to spend on, and do you think that those are the right priorities? What I would do is to go back to the exemptions that we're giving, mm. or you go back to the allowances that you are giving, like your accelerated allowance for research and development, for instance. Why am I giving 200%? Maybe I should be giving 100%. Right. So those are the kind of things that you will look at. Okay, so that's it's certainly, again, benchmarking against uh, what other markets are doing. Your view on the budget, Demo? Uh, I think, listen, the expenditure on issues such as education are primarily yeah. important to the development of the economy. If we can't bring and uplift all of the citizens, uh, then we can't grow mm. gross to about the GDP. You know, I think it was Winston Churchill once said that a country can't tax itself into prosperity. Yeah. It, that's like a man standing in a bucket. Mm. trying to pull himself up by the handle. So tax isn't the only answer. It needs, the expenditure needs to be spent on the right areas and the right programs. Infrastructure and education, mm. skill development are all critical to the development of any economy. Mm. And, and th there's always, of course, the conversation around understanding the risks to building efficient tax systems. And I want to get to that part of the conversation with you first, Lucia. What risks do you think tax administrators might be faced with in the African continent that might slow down their pace of ensuring that they evolve with global trends at a pace that also keeps up with the rest of the world? For me, it goes back to the right skills. That mm. is the first thing that you need to get right. Make sure that you have the skills for people to go after the right things. If I'm sitting as a tax director, I'm getting a letter from SAS or from KRA, for instance, and the things that they're asking me, I'm thinking, my goodness me, you took a month to write this letter, mm. but you have not asked me for anything that is of substance mm. that will result in once I have responded, you will actually collect something. We have a problem there. I think we need to resolve that. Again, skills coming back to the fore. What would you see as the biggest risk, Dermot? Uh, I think the risks um, are around an unbalanced tax system, mm. overly dependent on one form of taxes versus the rest. Uh, I do think we need to look at the issue of corruption. It's a very mm. important issue. I think uh, Transparency International recently published statistics that said 58% of the citizens on the continent of Africa believe that corruption is increasing. And that ro rose to, believe it or not, to 83% when it came to South Africa. So four out of five citizens of this country believe that in the last 12 months the position has got worse. And what's the impact on, the, on, on wanting to pay tax as a citizen? If, you, if your perception of corruption exactly. is high, exactly. one would conclude that you don't want to pay those taxes. Exactly. There's no incentive. Why would you give money into a corrupt system where you don't believe that the money you give is going to benefit the social programs that the mm. country badly needs? whether you're a direct beneficiary or not. Right. So everybody benefits if the, if the economy improves and the, and the currency stabilizes, etc. So that's for everybody's gain. But you have to have confidence in the system. Now, you, you've raised the issue of corruption. I'm going to extend it just a little bit. I want us to go to Nigeria very quickly, uh, Lucia, with what's happening between, uh, with uh, MTN and the regulators, uh, the telecoms regulator uh, in, in Nigeria. And it brings me to this issue around corporate taxes. Um, do you, again, in that particular view, think that African governments and tax administrators in particular have got the right approach to corporate tax to ensure that FDI comes in, um, companies are incentivized to come into the market, but also play their role in terms of contributing to building those economies? Uh, I don't think we where we're supposed to be. Like I said earlier, we are still evolving. You need the confidence. The, ta the taxpayers should say, I know that I am paying this much, but it is going to the right causes. And in Africa, the reality is that we know that it is not. So that social contract that you have between the taxpayer and the government is actually not bearing the fruits that it should be bearing. Mm. 
the social contract coming back to the four final question, Dermot, is I want to talk about the use of tax incentives in to develop uh, other industries, especially outside of the extractive industry. Does this make strategic sense if we're saying that we've had uh, historical reliance on extractive industries? Do we then use tax as a tool to further diversify and to extract investors, in, to attract investors, excuse me, into other industries? I think you need to be careful uh, that tax is only one of a wide range of, of uh, issues and things, tools to use in attracting direct investment. Mm. Um, we talked about some of them earlier on in terms of certainty, of transparency of the law, transparency of the political system. All of those are important to foreign direct investment. Mm. Foreign direct investment is badly needed if we're going to develop, because a lot of the countries across the continent of Africa are still very much agriculture based or commodities based. And if you're commodities based, you're wholly dependent on the volatility in the, of the pricing of commodities. Right, in global markets. If you're an agricultural economy, it's very hard because it's very diverse. Mm. There's very small, large numbers of small taxpayers who pay very little money. Um, so it, you need to attract an industrial base onto the continent. To do that, then tax can be a powerful incentive. Mm. Tax can be a powerful incentive to further attracting foreign direct investment into the African continent, but certainly is not the only one. And perhaps one of the other key points was that the social contract between those who lead and those are being led is really fragile at best, and transparent tax systems are one of the ways that this can be strengthened. A very big thank you to my guests who joined me here in the Johannesburg studio, Dermot Gaffney, Associate Director for Tax at KPMG, and Advocate Lucia Songwana, Africa Tax Leader at EY Advisory. For you at home, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Do join us next week. And of course, if you want to influence the kind of conversations and the topics that we take on on this show, all you need to do is just follow me on Twitter at CNBC Africa or at The Real Nosy. Don't forget that our hashtag is InvestAfrica. Until next time, it's goodbye.